Um, I'd like to now introduce our first keynote speaker of the morning, uh, Bob Pryor. Bob is president and CEO of Fujitsu North America. Uh, Bob joined Fujitsu um, a couple months ago, April of this year. Um, his responsibilities include all operations for our businesses between uh, Canada, the US, and the Caribbean. Bob joined Fujitsu with an extensive background in IT industry and management expertise, including uh, several senior executive functions at companies like Genpact and HP, uh, Capgemini, uh, and EDS. Um, Bob, uh, in addition to being my boss, so please give him a warm welcome when he <laughs> gets up here. Um, very nice. Um, is an avid jet skier um, and may have the distinction of all of our speakers of being the one who has both landed by a tail hook and uh, launched by a catapult from an aircraft carrier. So uh, without too much ado here, let's introduce Bob Pryor. Good morning, pleasure to be here. I'm going to try and put this where I don't spill it on the equipment or myself. I'm going to set it there. I know it's not visually appealing, but it's safe there. Um, I want to spend a few minutes this morning really talking about our role primarily around Fujitsu Americas and how do we help companies adapt technologies. Um, and it's funny, normally when I enter a room, I always kind of assume I'm never the smartest person in the room or the dumbest. As I met a few people this morning, I'm not prepared to say I'm the dumbest person here, but I, I know I've shifted down to the lowest quadrant. So just relatively uh, speaking, as I've met a number of PhDs and others, uh, and especially when you think about the folks in the labs, but our, our job is to really kind of help them identify those technologies, bring them to market, commercialize them, and most importantly, help companies adapt them to their business in rapidly, dramatically changing markets that they serve. Um, I'll give you one tip. I never read my own slides. So what I found is um, I can always, no matter what I put up there, you're always reading the slide, not listening to me. So my pattern is I'll let you kind of read the slide and then I'll give you the commentary and the context for it. So, so I give that tip as we get started. I do have one piece of, I hope I don't fail on this first piece of technology. Nope, I got it, okay. I love this quote. I think it really captures the moment about uh, being adaptive, being adaptive to highly changing, dramatically different environments. I never thought of Bruce Lee as a philosopher, but I, I found the insight great. What you typically see here when we talk about adapting is probably the Charles Darwin quote. I like this one better. Um, and for those of you that don't know Bruce Lee, he was Cato in the Green Hornet, which was a TV show I loved as a kid. Uh, had a very colorful career. I think one of the things to kind of keep in mind as we think about adapting is um, oftentimes historically computing meant helping companies uh, manage mass volumes of data and make decisions or run their business, process transactions. What's happened is there's a shift now and information is becoming the business. And that's a very profound market shift in our economy, and it's not just any one industry, any one geography. It cuts across almost all businesses. And even with companies that have physical products, the, the data that they capture around the physical products becomes almost as important as those products themselves. And so clearly the shift and the proliferation of data tells you we are an information centric society today. And that information becomes so key and critical to everything we do. And certainly our world and technology is very driven by that aspect. Another way to look at our framework of how do we think about inventing new technologies, commercializing them, taking them to market, integrating them, iterating them over time. Um, there is a lifelong debate, certainly in my lifetime that I've seen, which always starts with, should you invent the technology and then go look for a market? Should you identify the market um, and then kind of create a technology or solve the problem? So show of hands, how many of you believe you should first invent a cool technology or something very neat and then worry about finding the market later? So be honest. Okay, a number. How many of you would have said the opposite? That it's really, okay. Now Steve Jobs would have 
told the, the last group that raised their hands that you should find the market first, that you're completely wrong. His view was consumers didn't know what they wanted, and they had no real vision of what they should want. Um, I'm sure on a bad day he probably said it more bluntly that they're just too stupid to really know what they want, so we have to tell them. He's probably the lone example I've seen of someone that's been really successful with really creating a capability, a market, or a solution, or an offering without really knowing that there was a need or a market for it. Most of us fail when we do that. The reality is, I, th I think you have to really consider all of those elements. I think you have to start with a technology perspective. You have to invest in R&D. You have to experiment. You have to be prepared to fail. But ultimately, if you want to make money and sustain your company, your business, your, your investment, you're going to have to find a market that sees value in that that's going to pay money for it. And I think unless there's real revenue and profit that generates from that, it's going to be hard to sustain it over time. Ultimately, when you think of Fujitsu's vision around human-centric computing around societies and making those societies better, you have to really pull it together. So as we work the labs and we think about how do they create new technologies, what are the markets that we really see as application for those technologies? How do we take them? How do we find early adopters? How do we experiment? Ultimately, how do we really commercialize that in a much more significant, pervasive way? So, so I would suggest it's this framework in doing all of those things really well and over time that allow us to be successful. And I think, too, there's a big difference. I'll show you a couple examples of technologies that were way ahead of their time. One example around oil and gas exploration, which was 80 years ahead of its time but is incredibly pervasive in today's oil and gas market today. So that's the other aspect, is you can invent a great technology, it may ultimately find a market. Ideally, we'd like it to be in our lifetime, um, and it would be really terrific it were if it were this quarter. This is from the World Economic Forum, and it was identifying some critical, pervasive shortages we see in the world today. So you see on the economic risk, the, the, the extreme volatility of energy and ag prices. Um, I had one customer a few years ago, a very large consumer products company, and this is in the period of 06 to 07, I'm sorry, 07 to 08. It's year over year inflationary price index. It, the amount of money that they spent on inflationary products, their raw commodity goods, was 600 million year over year more than their budget. Their budget was almost a half a billion. They were 600 million off. That's the pervasiveness of that commodity price impact. And if you think about on a P&L, how do you ever, and again, in a market where they were selling, let's say, diapers and uh, paper products and consumables, which are very, very price inelastic, which means they couldn't pass it on, they had to be prepared to rip that kind of cost out of their cost structure just to sustain their profitability. And that's the environment many companies find themselves in today. There's a, a great quote from our president, uh, Yamamoto-san. Last year's Great East Japan earthquake and the flooding in Thailand taught that safety and security cannot be taken for granted. The effects of climate change and resource depletion from the world's population explosion are just some of the factors indicating the sustainability of the planet sinking into crisis. Scary, but, but very real when you think about it. We're entering a new era of rising food prices. I'm sorry, rising food prices. Rising food prices and uh, increasing hunger. And, it, and it's a scary proposition. So we're seven billion people on the planet far consuming, in fact, the last few years, consuming more than what we're actually producing to sustain ourselves. Anyone read Dan Brown's latest book, Inferno? Um, so the same author that brought us Angel, Angels and Demons uh, and Da Vinci Code brought us Inferno. Interestingly, it's number one on the New York Times bestseller list, and the premise around the story is about the explosive world population growth. And so it's a fictional account, but it's amazing how popular and topical that storyline is today. And again, if you come back to what the World Economic Forum is telling you, it, it is one of the big crises facing us today, certainly our generation and the next generation to come. I think there's an, another big question that always comes when we look over at energy prices. Do we have enough 
uh, energy. Is there enough adequate supply of energy to sustain ourselves and to continue with our GDP, not only for US, but all the countries around the world? There was a period for many years where the industrialized nations basically drove all of the energy consumption. About 2004, the rest of the world, um, instead of being the tail that wagged the dog, they actually became the fastest growing segment of energy consumption. So that whole world shifted, and then we went into a world of, are we running out of oil? U.S. has been a net importer for many, many years, and we worried increasingly that we were overly dependent on a lot of countries that don't like us very much. And so that issue has been a substantial, significant issue facing the U.S. economy for many years. Um, interesting thing, though, over the course of history, there have been at least five dire predictions of we're running out of energy. And each time, new technology, new ways of doing things, new capabilities, change that dynamic and rebalance the amount of supply versus the demand. Uh, I'll give you an example of one most recent trend which completely shifts the mindset of are we running out of oil and gas today? And in fact, can U.S. itself be a, uh, a net uh, exporter of oil and gas? First time in probably 100 years we even thought in that kind of dimension. Horizontal drilling and, and fracking, hydraulic fracturing. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the concept. Um, I'll give you a couple factoids on this. The first horizontal well was drilled in 1929. And horizontal drill is basically where you're going horizontally. So you go down and horizontal. So you're cutting across different formations under the Earth's core. Um, in 1908, an early form of hydraulic factoring was used to separate granite from bedrock. So you had these capabilities, but at $30 per barrel, it was uneconomic. Yet in the 1980s and the early 1990s, these kind of uh, exploration production techniques actually came into the market. Now at $100 a barrel, it's wildly economic. So if you look at Exxon's profit last year, I think it was $46 billion. That, that was their net income. So a lot of what's changed the dynamic around the world is these two concepts. So give you another factoid. Horizontal drilling was actually combined for the first time with hydraulic fractoring in the Barnett Shell in North Texas about 12, I'm sorry, Barnett Shell in North Texas about 12 years ago. So U.S. oil production since 2008 is now up 43%. For the first time, we look like a net exporter or a p ability to be a net, ex net exporter of oil and gas properties. That, that is completely um, against the grain of what everyone has thought all the, economies for the, all the economists for the last 50 or 60 years. So pretty dramatic. At the same time, we've created another issue or concern about the environmental implications of fracturing. Um, there's even a question of do they cause earthquakes. Uh, this is an interesting state to ask that question, but don't know, but I know that with technology, we have an ability to solve that problem as well, but this was the one that was critical to us. Our GDP, our growth, is completely relying upon energy and gas being available to us to feed our economies, unquestionably. I, I love this, this example. So we, we picked a VCR on the left side here. I don't know if everyone can see it, but it actually has a 12 o'clock. Okay, so how many of you remember that first VCR that you bought? Um, and how many of you were able to actually read the manual and get the 12 o'clock blinking light to go away? Okay, a few of you. All right, remember how I said I'm in the lowest quadrant here? I totally get that. I never got through that. The other thing I was never able to do was actually get it to record shows based on the program. I don't know if you remember, it felt like you were programming an algorithm to try and get it to tape a show at a certain time on a certain channel. Never could get there. So that concept of the VCR was introduced in the early 1970s. And then there was a big debate uh, Betamax effectively with VHS. So Sony bet on the Betamax. It was probably viewed as the superior technology, but ultimately lost to the v VHS. And part of that was VHS had a longer recording time, north of two hours, 
and it was a lower cost. So it, it actually had a much bigger adoption across the, uh, the various economies, certainly in the US, North America, Europe, that was, that was the pervasive one that was really ultimately accepted. Um, but what's interesting is when it was originally designed, it was intended to allow people to watch basically tapes of movies and TV shows and others. And then something on the right came along. I don't know how many of you remember TiVo. Uh, TiVo was introduced in the late 1990s, and now you've got the digital video recorder. And what was very different is where I couldn't get my 12 o'clock blinking light to go off, I was actually able to tape shows. And in fact, this DVR created a whole new concept now that enabled people to tape whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted, however they wanted, to eliminate commercials. So in 2006, I think the share of the DVR market was about 1% in the US. In 2011, it was 43%. So an amazing rapid growth. And again, what changed? We created devices that didn't force us to read 100-page manuals to program it. And I know in my lifetime, if I, if I buy something with a manual, it, it's never going to get read. So if I, can't figure it on, if I can't figure it out, trial and error, it's, just, it's not going to happen in my household unless... Actually, now my kids do that for me. So they'll program it for me. But basically, completely changed the pattern. Same fundamental concept of serving that market applied very differently, but with a human factor twist that enabled mass adoption. Now we bring it back to the energy market. How many of you have one of these in your home? This is the electronic programmable thermostat. Once again, it doesn't necessarily have a blinking 12 o'clock, but it's the same concept. Comes with a 50 to 100 page manual. If you figure it out, you can program it to change your thermostat in the morning and the evening. Uh, it can basically kind of take you to high temperatures during the day, so you're conserving energy. The vast majority of us that own them in our house never get past just pushing that up button or the down button to change the temperature. That's the way it works. Okay. So there's another product that came along, Nest. I don't know how many of you have seen this. Um, while building his high-energy efficient home near Lake Tahoe, Tony Fadell, former SVP of Apple's iPod iPhone division, went looking for a thermostat. He got frustrated by the features of the things on the left, and basically, he along with a colleague set out to redesign the thermostat. In May of 2010, uh, they formed Nest Labs in their garage in Palo Alto. Um, like TiVo, this one doesn't really force you to go read the manual. In fact, all you do is you switch it that way if you want it hotter. You, you go counterclockwise if you want it cooler. It'll then give you different colors depending on are you consuming more energy than you should you. It'll, it'll show you kind of red if you're, if you're probably getting it too cool. It'll also learn your pattern. So it'll know what you're adjusting it to in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. And it'll figure out if you're not at home. And so it can actually then take over for you and set the pattern. So when you're, when you're out of your house, it'll actually adjust the temperature so that it's basically preserving energy and ultimately reducing your bill. So this device here costs about 250 bucks, basically can allow you to reduce 20 to 30% of your home energy consumption. Likewise, it can eliminate that much of your utility bill month over month every year Further, it allows us to preserve some of our peak requirements on our utilities, which means we can actually avoid building that next coal plant, nuclear plant, gas plant, because we don't need it. So anything we can do to reduce energy consumption and preserve that capital spend has great benefit for the economy, has great benefit for us as, as consumers. So again, all we did was we changed the user, user interface, made it easy, intuitive for people to use it, it's also Wi-Fi enabled. So if you wanted to, if you forgot and you wanted to adjust it by your iPhone, your iPad, uh, you could do that. If you wanted to let it just take over, it'll do that for you once it knows basically the patterns and the parameters you want to set for it. But again, 20 to 30% of your energy consumption bill. Think about the impact of that and if you are replicating. So again, it's not so much to say buy the device, it's just think of the difference between 
what we've lived with for 30 and 40 years versus what's available that all enables you to take control over your energy consumption. This is a very, very busy slide, but I'll give you a couple factoids. Every day, according to IBM, we create 2.5 quintillion bytes of data. According to IBM, 90% of the data in the world today was created in the last two years. So clearly pervasive volumes of data being, being consumed. Now we again could debate the quality of the data, do we really need to keep it? I know if you're in the hardware storage business that it's actually a very good thing, uh, but ultimately the question of, you know, what do you do with all that data? How much is meaningful? Is it relevant? How do you sort through this? And what do you do with it? What do you keep? How long do you keep it? What insights can you gather from that data? That's becoming really the important part of it. So the era around analytics, decision support, analysis become far more important in terms of not just storing data and throwing hardware at the problem, but really thinking about what does the data allow us to do? What does it enable? Now we come to the K computer. So there are about seven billion people in the world today. If we, asked, if we gave them a calculator, asked them to calculate one function every second, 24 hours a day, um, it would take them 17 days to match what our K computer can do in just one second. So that's the computing power of the K computer. High performance computing can now deliver petascale processing, bringing outcomes that were virtually impossible years ago, in terms, especially when you think of the genome factor human genetics, really thinking about drug therapies on, on organs. You know, so a lot of the new drug therapies, a lot of the weather forecasting, they rely on supercomputers. It's the only thing that allows them to get through all the processing requirements and to consume that kind of data and to interpret it. The K computer is the world's first supercomputer that broke 10 petaflops barrier. So this, this is interesting, I didn't know this before. The number 10 peta, or 10 quadrillion corresponds to a one followed by 16 zeros. So in Japanese, it's expressed as one K, spelled K-E-I. Hope I'm saying that right. And that's why the supercomputer is called the K computer. I'm thrilled to say it was not inspired by the Kardashian family, has nothing to do with, with that K. Um, but it, it now helps us to really think about some of, the, some of the big issues out there around what do you do with the data? How do you, how do you interpret it? A uh, couple examples. One that I love was from a phone company. They, they were in the, the wireless business, and what they noticed is patterns of losing lots of subscribers. And so basically, in the highly commoditized world of wireless subscribers, they would have people switch. And they were trying to figure out why were they losing so many subscribers. And one of the things they found, using a lot of the analytics provided around this, are basically they saw a pattern where someone switched, and that was basically fo um, following an event where they lost someone in that person's network. So if you think of the friends and family program, someone would switch, they would see a pattern that they were following someone else in their calling environment that switched. What they found was someone they knew probably either got a better deal, was incented to switch, or they had a bad experience. And so using the data, what they des decided to do was to act upon it. So they created a program out there to identify when they lost a subscriber, they would look at all of the calling patterns of who they called, and they would send texts to those people and give them incentives to, to make sure they were incented with an enriched offer to stay with the company as opposed to follow. And it had a very substantial impact on reducing some of the, the loss associated with the friends and family program. You even see some of the phone companies out there specifically targeting that friend and family program. Um, another interesting example, uh, a lot of us have kids. There, there is an interesting correlation between diaper sales and beer sales. Now that I've said it, mentally you can kind of think about it, but um, in my experience, and I'm highly DDD, my wife would send me to the grocery store for diapers, and I know every time I did that, I would make a separate run to the beer aisle. So diapers, beer. And it, clearly in the, in the world of US consumers, I'm not alone. So uh, that paper company I mentioned to you before saw the pattern. Some of the smart retailers were actually able to design promotions. So they would, and I don't know if you realize it, but in a lot of retail stores, they will really move product around so that it forces you to, to basically follow 
or walk by something that you're likely to buy if you're buying something else. So all the promotions and all the way they lay out the store really driven by ultimately consumer buying preferences. Um, but again, those kind of insights, you're never gonna jump to them on your own. It's really by looking at the data, extrapolating it, and then basically identifying what insight should you take away. So, so last slide here, great to be on the forefront of design. Even better to help companies adapt to the technology. So in this example, data privacy, security protection, really hot topics in today's market, unquestionably. People worry about this. And we're all getting used to various forms of verification to validate we are who we say we are. So as we cross the, the border for immigration and customs, a lot of us now are giving kind of fingerprint scans. Um, it's not unusual in biometrics now to be giving retina scans. So Fujitsu has a great technology around, it's a biometric to read your palm. Um, interesting, so unlike the retina and the finger, and by the way, the retina scan, a lot of people don't like it. it it's a bit too invasive or intrusive for a lot of people, so there's a discomfort. Likewise, the fingerprint, you actually have to physically touch something. The palm scan, you don't. It can read it from about an inch and a half away. But the other interesting factoid around it is you actually have to be alive to have that palm successfully read from our scanner. So blood has to flow. So when you put it up, if you're using that to validate you are who you say you are at the ATM, you can at least be assured you're alive when you validate. Scary but interesting concept. So you come back to how do you help companies adapt technologies to serve the markets even better than what they originally intended. So that's our role as we work with labs and think about what they're doing and they're five years out, 10 years out, how do we bring those to the market? And also how do we bring prospective customers and early adapters to the labs to help them experiment and apply those and experiment and fail and get it better and better and better. And that's where I see our role. So ultimately, in the Americas as a systems integrator, as a systems integrator, as a consultant, as an outsourcer, how do we bring those capabilities? So with that, thank you very much. Appreciate it.